once again, thank you, Dr. Dr. Raju Babal and IOA for giving me the opportunity to present this topic. So this is a, a joint, as you all know, as uh, we see maximum instability and uh, mobility at the expense of stability. That's a feature of uh, shoulder joint and it's most frequently dislocated. And uh, more than 50% of all dislocations are, are in the shoulder joint. So when a case is kept in the examination, is very important and also uh, a few points in the history I will mention the age of the patient whether it is traumatic or traumatic whether it is associated with the pain uh, that's a very important feature so if there is an instability which is not painful then the management is going to be different and if the subluxation or dislocation is painful the management is different so I'll come to that uh, in the next slide so the history of pain and type of pain and how the injury occurred, and whether it's a voluntary dislocation, all these things are very important, I say. The most important point is whether the patient has got a convulsive disorder. Because the post of management and the management of the patient is going to depend on history. Before going to physical examination, I will just mention a few of the anatomical features, which will help us to understand the special test as well as the important points in the physical examination. So as I told, stability is the least, uh, least one, or the, it's the most unstable joint in the body, but the mobility is maximum. So mobility is achieved at the expense of stability. But uh, instability is not equal to joint laxity. But laxity is incomplete loss of glenohumeral articulation. Uh, it's unassociated with pain, that's laxity. And uh, it could be a subluxation or a dislocation. And a few anatomical features I will just brush through before going to physical examination. The most important features which keep the joint in position or intact are the bony anatomy, the negative pressure within the joint, and of course the most important ones are the dynamic structures. So what are the static structures? The glenohumeral stability is maintained mainly by the static and the dynamic structures. The static structures are the glenohumeral ligaments, the labrum, the articular concavity, intraarticular negative pressure, and the dynamic restraints are the rotator curve, the rotator interval, the biceps, and pericapular muscle. So the most important anatomy feature is that it's a concave glenoid, which is given more depth by the labrum, and uh, the glenohumeral ligament. And the most important one is the uh, inferior glenohumeral ligament, even though we have a superior, middle, and inferior. And the inferior glenohumeral just acts as a hammer along with the capsule. So this is the most important static uh, structure of, for the stability. And if you have a disruption of the IGHL or the inferior glenohumeral ligament, first you get an inferior subluxation, then it goes anteriorly. So that's the mechanism of anterior instability. So there are so many other uh, osteology uh, points so which will be very important for the postgraduate uh, to understand why a joint is going to be stable. It's a pear shaped uh, glenoid, and uh, in that glenoid, a globular humeral head is articulated, and uh, it is around 7 degrees of retroversion and 5 degrees of the superior tilt. And uh, this version on the humeral side and the glenoid is very important. And, and we all know that the humeral head is bigger than the glenoid, and that is why you get a lot of movements like the circumduction. But it is pear shaped, it is narrow superiorly and wide anteriorly. So if you have a huge head articulated with a small glenoid, of course mobility will get, but at the expense of stability. So this is one point you should understand. So it can be easily assessed in investigations like MRI. And this is one point you should remember. It's a negative intraarticular pressure, which will give a lot of stability. And for this, the integrity of the anatomical structures is also important. When one of the anatomical structures like a labrum is ours, you don't get a negative intraarticular pressure, and that causes instability. So when you repair the labrum, it is not that a piece of a labrum you repair is uh, retained and that gives you stability, but it is the negative pressure which will develop when you repair the labrum, and that's important for uh, stabilizing the shoulder. So the dynamic structures are the cuff muscle. Now, when you have a massive cup there, that's one cause of instability. Now, why cup there cause instability? Because as I told, it's a pear-shaped uh, glenoid articulated with a huge globular humeral head. And if the deltoid has to act, the humeral head has to be stabilized within the glenoid. Then only the 
other abductors can act. So if the uh, rotator cuff muscles are not acting, then of course there is going to be a reverse capillar rhythm uh, and it's not going to be a normal capillar rhythm. So if the cuff muscles are not there, the glenoid cannot be stabilized. So within the, uh, the human head cannot be stabilized within the glenoid and you get instability. So massive cup tear is one reason why you should get uh, instability. And uh, the important point is that the cup helps in uh, bringing down the huge femoral head into the widest part of the glenoid. And in that position, it is stabilized. And when that femoral head is stabilized in that position, the deltoid will act and produce movement. So if such a sort of stabilization does not occur in the shoulder joint, then you get a lot of problems like instability, reverse capillary rhythm, reduced abduction. And that's why when you rotate the cuff, uh, even though the deltoid is intact, you will not get abduction. So what you get is uh, the huge part of the tumor head will articulate with the narrowest part of the pear-shaped glenoid, and that will prevent further abduction. So even though the deltoid is normal, the deltoid will not be able to act. Because the tumor head is not stabilized, first of all, it is not brought down to the widest part of the glenoid, so it will not act. So as we taught the postgraduate students that the initial few degrees of abduction is created by the supraspinatus or the cup, it has already changed. The concept around the shoulder has changed, and we now know that it is not the initial five degrees of abduction or uh, 10 degrees of abduction that is created by the supraspinatus. It is actually the cuff muscle which brings down the globular tumoral head to the widest part of the glenoid and stabilizes it there. So from first few degree itself, the delta can act. And this principle is applied in the reverse shoulder arthroplasty. So rotative interval is also important. The long set of biceps, another stabilizing structure, and also the pericapillary muscles, which is already discussed. I'm not going into the details. Now, what is the pathological anatomy? As you all know, there could be a abnormality in the normal anatomy that will produce a subluxation or dislocation or instability. The Bunkart lesion, as you all know, is an avulsion. It is an avulsion of the glenoid. It could be an avulsion of the glenoid labrum along with a piece of bone, which is known as osseous Bunkart lesion, which is posterior, you call it reverse Bunkart lesion. And if you have an avulsion which is small, you call it persis. If you have an anterior periosteal sleeve avulsion, you call it arch lesion. And that could be a cartilage piece also which could get our So these are some of the pathological features by which you can get a dislocation. Another point is a, another pathological feature is a postlateral defect in the humeral head, which is already discussed by Dr. Bupesh. And this is a, again a reason why you can get a, a dislocation. So this is a hill stack lesion. So I'm not going to the details, it's already, it is already discussed. Now, another point you should remember is uh, excessive laxity. You have to be a good examination of the patient, general examination to assess the laxity of the other joints. So excessive capillary laxity uh, could cause a multidirectional instability. And uh, traumatic instability is uh, again a fracture or an avulsion of the glenoid. And the mechanism of injury is an axial load in a flex adducted position. And it results in an avulsion of the uh, labrum or a piece of bone or a fracture or the anterior brim of the glenoid. So this concept is that when you have a problem with the restraint, you have two restraints, the primary restraint and the uh, uh, secondary restraint. The primary restraints are in the direction of instability and the opposite one is the secondary uh, restraint. So you have to examine both anterior and posterior. So basically it is classified into traumatic and a traumatic. Traumatic is uh, less laxity, it is unidirectional. Atraumatic is more laxity and multidirectional. This is a famous classification, which is known as a traumatic unidirectional bunkard lesion and surgery is a treatment. This will be asked in the examination. And the other is uh, a traumatic multidirectional bilateral rehabilitation is the treatment and inferior capsular shift or a closure of the uh, rotated interval would help the patient. So the chronic instability is again just and embry, I'll just repeat it. Uh, Tubs is traumatic unidirectional bunkard lesion in surgery is a treatment. Ambry means a traumatic multidirectional bilateral rehabilitation and inferior capillary shift with the close of the rotator interval is going to be the treatment. This is, this is our oldest classification. Yes, so many other classifications have come up. I like a stand more classification. I don't think it is very important for the PG, so I'll just skip that slide. Now, the frequency is very important. When you look at this patient and examine this patient, acute or recurrent or a fixed um, dislocation or subluxation and the etiology is it traumatic, is it a traumatic, it is a uh, neurological problem or epilepsy, this is also very important. And when you look at this uh, patient, you have to look 
indicate whether it's an anterior instability or it's a posterior instability, inferior instability, superior or multidirectional. And the degree of instability is also quite important, the subluxation or the dislocation. Now, for the patient, uh, it's very important to tell you everything. And for the surgeon, it is very important to take a detailed history on how the injury has occurred. This I have already discussed in the, in the beginning of this presentation. I will move on to the physical examination. As I told, uh, this is going to be a case in your examination. This is not very, it's not very uncommon to get a case like a dislocated shoulder or an instability in the examination. So you have to follow all the steps like uh, inspection, palpation, range of motion, and movement, uh, measurements, the winging, then the neurovascular testing, general ligamentous activity, and the special tests. And special tests are very important in your examination. So assessment by the surgeon is a frank instability or a, it's just an apprehension which is positive. Uh, and uh, you have to understand that uh, you have to follow the sequence of examination, like inspection, palpation, movement, measurement, special test like that. So on inspection is usually atrophy or asymmetry around the shoulder. Tenderness uh, is very important to be elicited. If a joint which is unstable or dislocated or subluxated is non-tender, then it's going to be a, uh, a ligamentous laxity, which is for the instability, and the treatment is going to be different. If there is some pain, it could be traumatic and the treatment is going to be different. So it's very important to elicit tenderness. Then active and range of motion and the passive range of motion and the strength of the muscles like a deltoid, rotator cuff, and the, the scapula stabilizers, the muscles which attaches scapula to the thorax and the muscles which attaches the scapula to the humerus. So you have to classify those muscles and look for the power and strength of the muscle. Assessment of the nerve injury and impingement and special tests, I'll go in detail in the next slide. So anterior dislocation of the shoulder, this is a one unreduced uh, dislocation. This is not part of the topic because instability is given, but an unreduced anterior dislocation also you can get in the examination. And the simple tests are Hamilton's ruler test. I think everyone will know about what is this test means. To put a scale on the lateral aspect of the humerus, usually uh, the lateral epicondyle and the humeral head when the scale touches, it will never touch the acromion. If there is a dislocation, the scale will touch both the tip of acromion and lateral epicondyle. So it's a Hamilton ruler test. Another test is uh, Dugas test. Ask the patient to lift the affected limb and keep it on the opposite shoulder. If uh, the patient cannot do that, then that means the shoulder is dislocated. And Calavic test is a test where you measure the width of the uh, axillary fold. In Calavic test, uh, if the width is more than the opposite side, then the shoulder is Okay. Now we'll go to the provocative test and quantitative test for instability. So test for anterior instability are the crank test, the fulcrum test, job test, and the test for posterior instability. Now this is a sulcus test, it's a very famous test. Patient is sitting or standing and the shoulder is neutral position, the muscles are relaxed. You just give a downward pressure, the dimpling of the skin below the acromion, or widening of the subacromial space more than two centimeters means that the joint is unstable. So this is all tested. Then there's a shift and load test. It's a sign of instability. You can subluxate and relocate. And this is a test for instability. Now, what is anterior instability? The provocative tests are the crank test. Patient sitting at the arm abducted 90 degrees with the increasing external rotation. The examiner exerts anterior translatory force with his thumb like posteriorly on the humerus and watches for apprehension. So it's an apprehension test. Apprehension test is diagnostic of instability. And if only pain is, if there is pain, then it's significant. If it is painless, uh, then it's also significant because we look for laxity. Another test is a relocation test. Examiner repeats apprehension test and notes the amount of external rotation before the onset of apprehension, then applies posterior stress on the humeral head and repeats external rotation whenever and again note that external rotation at the onset of apprehension. Increase in external rotation uh, uh, is uh, going to be a positive test and that is the relocation test. So this is the relocation test. Now the fulcrum test, the patient is supine, the scapula supported at the edge of the table and the arm is positioned at 90 degrees of abduction with increasing external rotation and the examiner watches for apprehension. Now there are some uh, provocative tests, this is a jerk test. Patient is supine with 90 degree forward flexion, shoulder and elbow at 90 degree, and the camera applies posterior direct force holding the forearm. So the jerk test is also diagnostic of an instability. And the circumdescent 
that is the patient standing, examiner standing behind and holds the arm in extension and abduction performs some circumduction. Visible subluxation, apprehension uh, in a position of forward flexion of 90 degrees uh, and adduction is a sign of instability. So these are the special tests uh, for a unidirectional instability. Now, multidirectional instability means there's going to be a ligament that's laxity and you get some patients who are dislocated, you can subluxate or uh, dislocate the shoulder in any direction. So it could be a, a psychiatric or a psychosomatic problem or it's a ligament that's laxity you have to define. Now, when you get such patients, you have to investigate. You can ask for an APV, you can ask for a normal APV and look for the relations of the bony structures. You can ask for an axillary view, or uh, this view will tell you uh, what the relation between the humeral cases and the uh, glenoid in actually anterior or posterior direction. So, whether it's a posterior dislocation or not, if you have any doubt, always ask for an axial view, and that will tell you whether there is a posterior dislocation or not. Otherwise, you will miss a posterior dislocation. So, uh, right shoulder in internal rotation and uh, capillary Y view, this already highlighted. Uh, when you have a patient with a suspected that uh, problem in under the scapula, this, this x-ray will help you. So, these are the, some of the views which will definitely help you to identify uh, instability. But if you take a CT scan, all these x-rays, uh, even though they are helpful, you get more information in a CT scan. You know about the bone loss, you know bone loss on the humeral head and also on the glenoid. And MRI is also important. So, in many of the shoulder instability cases, you need both MRI and and also CT scan because MRI will tell you about the soft tissues like uh, labrum and uh, cuff muscles and uh, it is not uh, quantitatively tell you what is the bone loss. It has to be assessed in a CT scan. So you need both CT and MRI to assess the patient to decide about the final management. So MRI is also important about soft tissues. Bone is well seen in the CT scan. So if somebody asks you the examination which in which tissue you will do for the bone is CT scan for soft tissues it is MRI. Now we'll go to the treatment part. I just brush through that. You know, to get a detailed discussion in the examination about treatment, but still you should know some of the features. So it's very important to know in nutshell what will you do for such instability cases. So it is a young patient or a high activity level and a procedure of choice is arthroscopic bulgar lesion with capsular application, uh, open bulgar lesion with capsular sheet, open capsular sheet or remplissage. That is a soft tissue procedure which you have. Then bony procedures are in the uh, Bristol procedure and lethargic procedure. And it's almost the same procedure, but uh, it's some little different because those tools are used and how you put the graft is important. Now that treatment, bony treatment, we all use this uh, lethargic technique. Then you have a oval technique, which is not uh, uh, done nowadays, but you should know for the, uh, for the reasons of uh, history purpose, or if you're not uh, you're interested in the history, that's a pretty plan. And then magnosense procedure is not nowadays done. So capsule application, and uh, we need uh, a definite reason why and how much you should shift the capsule. And if you shift too much, it is going to have stiffness. So capsule shift is uh, one procedure which you do, especially in a traumatic cases and laxity. And sometimes you close the rotator interval as well to produce some sort of a stability. So you have to define group. You have to assess the patient, the anatomical features, and then you need a well-motivated patient who is uh, able to participate in the rehabilitative process. Then all it is going, the surgery is going to be useful. So you can use a capsular application for uh, a traumatic cases, and uh, this is one technique you use for uh, laxity cases. So capsular labral repair, like a bulk repair or a modified uh, repair or a subscapularis. Uh, subcapillary procedure like uh, putiplast, which is for historical reasons you should know, and uh, arthroscopic bungard repair is a gold standard. And uh, uh, open bungard lesion is uh, going to be a difficult procedure for surgeons because uh, it's very difficult to reach that area. But there are of course some surgeons who think that uh, open bungard lesion uh, repair also has got its own goal. But the gold standard nowadays is arthroscopic bungard repair. Uh, and uh, because it's very difficult to reach that area by open means, for the scopic surgeon, it is so easy to reach that area. So you need to uh, uh, know about puticlite. This is uh, not very important for your examination, but somebody asks, you should know what is the puticlite procedure. It's a double breasting of the subscapularis muscle. Nowadays, it is not done. But let's 
the procedure is still used open or arthroscopic and uh, it's where you cut a piece of the coracoid fossa with the shorter of biceps and you fix it to the capillary neck with two screws. So let us the procedure. Uh, the indications all depend on how much bone loss you have. This is called the highlighted by Dr. Bubesh Karthik, where he told that the 25% loss is the one benchmark. Uh, you decide whether you need a lethargic procedure or not. So when there is a defect in the anterior green oil, you have to reconstruct it. You can use a electric bone graft or you can use a coracoid process along with shorter devices. But the advantage of using a lethargic procedure is that you have a sling effect of the shorter devices anteriorly. But if you use a electric graft, that sling effect is not there. So better procedure is a lethargic procedure. So it's a lethargic procedure. Uh, so uh, this is in nutshell about the management of these cases, and uh, I'll just go to two slides on posterior instability. Here, uh, if you take an X-ray, you see what is known as a light bulb sign, and this you think that the head is within the glenoid, but if you take an axillary view, you'll know that the head is outside. So it's important to take an axillary view in the uh, shoulder instability of this occasion case. Now posterior procedures. Uh, you go, here you have a reverse bulbar lesion and uh, reverse field lesion. Because the posterior labrum has doubled. So, you need an arthroscopy for open repair. Again, arthroscopy is easier uh, for a posterior bulgar solution repair, and that is about the posterior instability as well. Now, the patient has to follow regular phases of rehabilitation. If that is not followed, then the outcome of these patients are going to be very bad. So, rehab procedures, you have to optimize control muscles, the scapular muscles, range of motion. And the patient has to involve into the best rehabilitation procedure as possible if the patient or the surgeon wants to get the best. Thank you for patient listening. Once again, thanks to IOA and Professor Dalibaba for giving me this opportunity. Thank you.